really warm welcome to you, Joel. Um, and yeah, really look forward to your lecture. Thanks so much. Um, pleasure. Thank you, um, Annie, for that um, kind introduction. And also thank you for inviting me to um, speak to everyone today. I mean, it's, um, it's so weird giving lectures like this um, on the internet. I can see myself in a tiny little box um, on the bottom corner of my screen. I can't see any of you, um, but getting lots of notifications that um, people have joined the session. So it's such a um, kind of mediated and strangely uh, distant way of um, connecting. So, you know, I, I think what I'd appreciate is, um, you know, a bit of um, constant feedback to, to let me know that you're listening, um, that you're out there and some sort of signs of life. Um, as Annie mentioned, it is um, 1.30 in the morning where I'm speaking from um, in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I'll, I'll start, you know, but by, by acknowledging um, that Melbourne is a colonial construct, um, as is so-called Australia. It's um, uh, um, the, the land that I'm speaking on is, is in fact Aboriginal land. Um, it always has been and always will be. It's unceded, um, stolen land of an uh, um, Aboriginal group called uh, Wurundjeri, a, a language group. Um, so I pay respects to um, First Nations people um, and acknowledge that I'm an uninvited guest on their land when, when I'm speaking um, to you tonight. Um, yeah, um, hopefully I can stay on topic and sort of stay coherent over the next hour or two as um, it clocks over into 2 a.m. and, and 3 a.m. Um, I'll do my best. It's a rather informal sort of mode of presentation, uh, I think, that I'll um, pursue. I don't have a PowerPoint. I've got some tabs um, in my browser that I'll work through, but I think um, what I plan to do is just give a, a kind of um, mostly discursive um, introduction to my um, work, my, my, my sort of background, um, my curatorial um, methodology and, and ideas, and also the work I do with liquid architecture. Um, it, what might be um, nice, I can see there's a bit of activity in the chat and a couple of um, old friends, um, Nikki um, Sheth is there and Stephen Ball and um, John Wynn, who's said hello. Um, so it's very nice to know that you're out there listening. Um, it would be great if everyone who is listening um, could perhaps uh, say hello in the chat and, and also um, let me know where you're listening from, where, where you're tuning in from, um, you know, if it's London, which part, if it's somewhere else, um, let me know and um, if it's somewhere else in the world, even better. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, okay, so where am I going to start? And here we go. I can, I'm getting lots of um, pings. So <laughs> perhaps we can just have a listen to um, those pings over the next 10 seconds because I think it's quite a nice sound. Super. Thanks, everyone. Um, really nice to be with you all um, in the early morning, my time, um, and whatever time it is for you there. Um, hello, Sarah Ramshaw, tuning in from Vancouver um, in Canada. Um, okay, so I I'll give a little bit of um, biographical context because I think um, it's helpful, helps sort of ground um, some of the things that I'll talk about as we go along. Um, you know, so my, um, I guess, introduction to sonic art, experimental sound, um, it sort of begins um, as a teenager li listening to 
community radio in Melbourne, listening to um, radio stations like 3 R and PBS. These are sort of long running um, uh, volunteer based community radio stations that are kind of And kind of um, listening to graveyard shifts, especially 2 a.m. till 6 a.m. Uh, sessions uh, in, in which um, DJs kind of unsupervised um, would go in the studio and play long form experimental works um, and kind of um, with, with the sort of amateur um, presentation styles that, that we know well from community radio. And in, in some ways that experience of sort of listening to sound late at night listening to a broadcast sort of beamed um, into my um, teenage bedroom, um, hearing um, improvised music, hearing uh, minimalism, hearing 20th century avant-garde music um, as a teenager kind of um, it, in a way um, seduced me and, and drew me into um, a sense of the possibilities for being transported through, um, let's say, an encounter with experimental sound in whatever form. Um, and, and that led me to, um, you know, uh, enrol in an undergraduate degree at, at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, a kind of technical college um, here in Melbourne in, in, in media studies and media arts. Um, and that was in the late 90s. And the media arts uh, course at RMIT um, in that period was had a kind of pioneering um, dimension to it. It was uh, one of the first sort of fundamentally interdisciplinary um, art courses, at least offered in Australia um, at that time. So, you know, there, there, there were students working in sound production, video art, um, radio, television, cinema, uh, and all working together in a kind of post-medium um, context in which, uh, you, you know, rather than sort of be siloed in different um, disciplinary or, or, or kind of medium groups, we were encouraged to kind of focus on uh, how the ideas, approaches, methodologies, sort of interests and practices we had uh, might be articulated a, a, across the boundaries of different mediums. And, you know, there were some um, fairly influential figures um, involved with that that course including you know people like Philip Brophy who some of you um, might be aware of who's a, a kind of leading expert on anime and film sound um, often um, contributes to the wire um, the cinema studies tutor um, in that course was Claire Stewart who, who went on to be the director of London Film Festival and um, you know a uh, um, director of the BFI in London and so it was it was a course where there was a um, in that late nineties, early two thousands period in Melbourne. There was an environment um, where young students working with technology and media, and especially sound, uh, were starting to feel like something new was happening and something exciting was happening, um, and we had a very strong sort of focus on new technologies um, and. and a, I guess younger and emerging artists, um, but I, I moved to London uh, in 2000 um, immediately after um, graduating that RMIT um, program, and uh, as as Annie mentioned, I found myself in the um, the nascent sound art class um, sound art program at London College of Printing, as it was then um, called, and I, I think I was maybe in the first or second cohort um, first or second year of students um, to go through that program with um, lecturers like John Wynne who's who's listening tonight but also David Toop, um, Kathy Lane, Peter Cusack um, and others and um, in some ways that was sort of um, the first time that I really um, had a sense of sound art or sonic art as let's say, a kind of um, a historical tradition um, and a contemporary practice and a kind of um, a, a way of um, identifying as, as a practitioner 
that had that had not only some sort of traction within an art context, but uh, had a field of sort of coherent references um, that you could draw upon. And I think around that time, um, David Toop curated, you know, a, a fairly significant um, exhibition at the Hayward Gallery in um, in London called Sonic Boom, um, which um, in some ways sort of solidified um, this idea of sound art as a, a, as a genre of art, um, you know, although, of course, um, even at the time, there were um, many people who were critical of these attempts to kind of um, bring what, you know, were a, a disparate set of practices into a kind of medium um, definition. But, you know, that, that, that period in London um, at London College of Printing, but also more broadly, was I extremely formative for me. So it, it, it was not just exposure within this um, sound up program, but it was exposure to the um, kind of improvised and experimental music scenes um, in London around the, the early 2000s um, period clubs, um, like the Clinker with a kind of, um, you know, Dadaistic, surrealistic, avant-garde approach um, to improvisation with a, you know, foregrounding um, amateurism, you know, in a certain way, uh, intergenerational collaboration. Um, the um, activities of the Bowman brothers um, in South London, the um, improvised workshops that were staged by Eddie Prevo, the um, percussionist associated with the group um, AMM, um, who, who in a way sort of um, really made an argument that improvisation um, should be thought of not just as a musical practice, but as a kind of um, way for modelling collaboration as a sort of model for civil society, as a, as a kind of an ethical practice, um, as a form of real-time problem solving, um, as a way of thinking um, about, you know, social and political as well as musical um, relationships. Um, the London Musicians Collective, the beginning of Resonance FM, um, which I believe is, you know, still going strong. And um, I had a program uh, called Framework, which was a um, focused on field recordings and environmental sound, which was um, a, a program that was broadcast in the earliest um, uh, period of, of, of Resonance FM during its sort of trial um, broadcast. And and, and going forward as well. So, I mean, can you tell I'm a little bit nostalgic? Not not really, but I just want to say that um, that period for a sort of young Australian artist um, being in, in London and sort of um, also, you know, with Lux Cinema and the experimental film scene, experimental music and all of this activity, um, it kind of set me on a life uh, path which, you know, is um, for better or worse continuing. Um, and all of those references um, and experiences kind of continue to sort of reverberate and resonate um, for me in different ways. Um, so I'm going to just sort of move on a little bit. And um, I, I um, came back to Australia around 2004, 2005, and I might just share my screen um, at this point and start to show you a couple of things. Um, so I'm going to share my entire screen and let's see if that works. Um, okay, you um, seeing there just the little radio studio of um, the community radio station that I was uh, broadcasting from in um, Melbourne as a teenager in the late 90s. That's the best image of it um, I could find. Um, it was the student radio at RMIT. But um, quite soon after um, I came back to Australia in, in the mid-2000s, um, I became involved 
with um, this collective other film. Um, I was based in Brisbane, um, which is uh, the third biggest city in Australia up the east coast in, in a state called Queensland. And it's a city that has a kind of historically, um, let's say, marginal um, relationship, peripheral, provincial um, kind of status in relation to Melbourne and Sydney. But, you know, in its provincialism, um, it also has a kind of rich um, countercultural tradition of, you know, art, punk, um, underground activity, um, and more. And so during those years um, in Brisbane with other film, I was r really focused on um, the kind of intersection of moving image art um, and experimental sound. I was sort of becoming, um, let's say, very interested in the way in which um, the production of sound within the space of experimental moving images was its own um, kind of alternate tradition. And I, I, I don't just mean sort of film sound as in sort of film composing or sound design, but I also mean the kind of um, the sonic worlds produced um, by experimental filmmakers almost as a byproduct um, of their sort of structural material um, processes, things like optical sound and sound that was sort of, um, you, you know, um, materially connected to modes of editing celluloid and, and things like that. And in some ways, um, I think what was happening for me at that point was I was starting to move away from certain musical traditions um, and start to think about sound in kind of more um, holistic um, or kind of conceptual and also methodological terms. Um, and I was also, you know, very influenced at that point by um, the French um, music concrete and film sound theorist Michel Chion and his ideas um, on audio vision. So, oh, look at that feedback. Uh, that's interesting. So are you all still um, with me? Give me a sign if you are, because it's uh, almost 2 a.m. here. And um, OK. <laughs> All right, very good. Thank you. That's all very encouraging. Um, all right, I'm going to um, I'm going to move on from um, the endless uh, bio and start talking about liquid architecture because I think you know pro probably there is where um, it starts to get sort of most relevant for you guys and most interesting. So. This organisation, Liquid Architecture, um, it's, I took on the artistic direction of the organisation in 2013, um, moving back to Melbourne for the first time in, in sort of 12 or 13 years, you know, the city where I grew up, to take on this organisation that um, had a sort of status as, let's say, the key um, sonic art organisation in Australia in some ways, or at least the, the organisation that had sort of tethered itself, you know, most strongly to the idea of a sonic art. So uh, I might just say a little bit about the history of liquid architecture, because I think it's important, you know, contextual information. Um, this organisation formed in the late 90s, I think 99, 2000, so it's, it's, it's 20 years old. Um, it formed out of that sort of interdisciplinary environment at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. Um, the idea of cross-disciplinary practice, experimental practice, um, it, it started at that time as a showcase for the work of staff and students in the media arts um, program. Um, Philip Brophy, Philip Samartsis, who I mentioned, um, it, um, the name Liquid Architecture, we, you know, for, for, for many years I thought it came from a quote um, 
by Goethe, which or a quote which is attributed to Goethe, which is that um, architecture is frozen music, um, and that you know we had simply completed the thought by adding to that that music is liquid architecture, and and, and that may that may well be um, where the name comes from. It that quote is also variously attributed to von Schelling, so it's sort of one of those quotes. Maybe no, maybe nobody said it in the first instance. Um, but it's it's kind of um, in the history books. But then um, I was told later on doing some historical research um, by Simon Sellers, who is one of the co-founders of the organisation and who, who later went on to um, to produce the the, the website Balladian um, is, is one of the... Um, preeminent J.G. Ballard scholars, he told me that liquid architecture came from um, a, an essay by the American, early American cyberspace theorist Marcus Novak. Um, the essay is called Liquid Architecture in Cyberspace, um, in which he talks about this sort of impossible, endlessly um, folding and unfolding architectures of the internet. Um, and then later, Philip Brophy told me that the name came from uh, Kojo Eshin's uh, essay, Liquid Dystopias. Um, and Kojo Eshin, um, who, who, who many of you will know, um, incredible theoretician um, and, um, and researcher, had been to Australia a number of times in, in, in the late 90s. Um, and perhaps it had had influenced in some ways the development of this organization. But nevertheless, um, over the following ten years, liquid architecture became um, a national touring festival of experimental music and sonic art, um, an annual touring festival. and um, it, it it sort of represented um, the more serious, rigorous, um, you could say, kind of Eurocentric, in a way, um, modernist, um, experimental um, a, approach to thinking about Sonic Art very much um, with the concert and the exhibition um, as the key formats. Um, let's say, um, you, you know, a, a, a kind of, um, I'm tempted to say humorless, not humorless, but a, a kind of self-serious um, sensibility um, that, you know, m many of you might be familiar with, with um, kind of fairly severe um, aesthetics of abstract and experimental sound either you know, in the concert or the gallery, and and and, and not a str not a strong, as far as I'm concerned, um, engagement with, you know, um, social practice, you know, <laughs> political practice, um, you know, feminism, um, and other kind of like r radical cultural interventions. It was it was, it was very much um, a, a, a kind of um, at that stage, um, I would say. A, a sort of unreconstructed modernist approach to experimental music, which was in contrast to other um, platforms in Australia at the time, you, you know, maybe most notably um, What Is Music Festival, which was run by the, the musician Oren Ambarchi um, and, and which had the opposite sensibility, um, one which was completely irreverent, which favoured um, outsider kinds of artists in which saw noise um, primarily as a kind of form of, let's say, sort of social disruption or social sort of excess um, and was kind of filled with um, sort of humour and surprise. So you sort of had these two poles, li liquid architecture, the sort of more serious sonic art festival and what is music, the um, kind of more rat bag um, countercultural um, sort of... It, you know, outsider-ish community. Um, so um, I I took on Liquid Architecture in 2013 um, 
with a co-artistic director, um, Danny Zavala. And, um, you know, the first thing that we did was dissolve the festival format. Um, and, and, you know, there were many reasons for that. I mean, one of them was that um, much of what we wanted to do was not festive. Um, it sort of, um, we wanted to work on projects um, at um, any scale, um, at any time, um, in, in sort of, a, in any way, so pro pro projects could be um, as large or small as they needed to be, a, a, a could sort of comprise of, you know, one event on one afternoon or um, could be spread over the course of the of a year we wanted to be more sort of formally experimental and and most of all i, I think I, I wanted to think about um you know experimental sound culture um as something that is sort of infused with public culture in a sort of day-to-day -day way so rather than the big stage of the festival we were thinking about this sort of let's say more distributed um stage of the kind of um of your daily practice um and so you know by 2014 15 um uh, uh, under danny and my direction um liquid architecture had become a year-round program of you know often one or two events a week you know 50 or 60 events over the course of a year um, comprising lectures, workshops, um, digital publishing, um, gigs, um, symposia, um, production of, of objects and publishing, um, research, and, and, and all sorts of sort of other um, activities. So just to um, give you a sense of some of the um, the programs that we developed in, in those early days. Um, this program, um, and just give me a sign that you can uh, see what would a feminist methodology um, sound like. I'll I'll hear the ping if you can. Let's have a look. Yep, ting ting. Okay, let's go back to it. <clears throat> okay, what would a feminist methodology sound like? It's 2015. It's you know five and a half years ago now, so <clears throat> I can hardly remember it. But um, this was, uh, and I guess what I'm trying to do here is introduce you to my, um, you know, curatorial methodology for sound um, that that was that I was trying to develop um, in the context of liquid architecture and and you know when I say sound um, I'm almost always mean and listening um, you know and so you know when I say the production of sound I most I almost always mean and you know the politics ethics aesthetics of listening um, and I think that's an important point because, uh, you know, as we know, there are so many different modalities um, uh, and kind of, let's say, um, different um, subjectivities that are brought to the act of listening, which in a way, um, you know, need to be shared, communicated, sort of um, transformed um, and challenged um, in sort of social space. And anyway, at least that's the kind of provocation that I want to make. So, you, you know, with this project, what would a feminist methodology sound like? I think, I think the important <clears throat> thing to say there is, you know, firstly, it's a, um, it's a question, it's a proposition. Um, and a, 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 our approach was to sort of ask this question to 
um, a, a whole lot of artists, um, a, a, about 30 artists um, from across a number of disciplines, um, you know, writers, poets, political activists, um, musicians, artists working in every medium. Um, and, and to sort of think of the responses um, as, as a kind of a survey or an index um, that in a way as a form of knowledge production that extends out of a common question. So I was starting to think of, you know, curating and curatorial research, you know, very much in terms of knowledge production and, and you know, the idea of a common question um, or a common point of departure in a project like this was that in, in some ways all of, all of the responses were comparable, um, you, you know, and all of the responses could be sort of set together um, in, in order to map out a, a, a particular terrain. So, I mean, I think this was also <clears throat> an important moment um, for liquid architecture in, in asserting um, a kind of feminist politics within our organisation. Um, historically, it had been very much a boys with toys Kind of organization and and seen um, you, you know reproducing certain um, patriarchal um, tendencies to do with um, you know technology power agency um, and this was a project that was female led queer led um, had many um, Indigenous artists, artists of um, every gender, um, and kind of asserted a politics of listing um, that was, in a way, much more radical, radically inclusive. Um, and I think, you know, um, in some ways set a template for liquid architecture's work to come. At the same time, um, this project, um, Why Listen to Animals, um, the following year, um, you can see here um, an image of the incredible um, Chilean uh, poet um, Cecilia Vicuña on, on, on the left there um, in the middle of a performance that she gave called Why Listen to Animals. Um, you know, this uh, project extended from John Berger's, um, you know, canonical essay, Why Look at Animals, in which he sort of charts the, um, I suppose, history of the human relationship um, with the animal um, and especially the sort of reproduction of the animal as an image that um, goes from sort of being a sacred image within um, the kind of you know, cosmology of, of human experience into being this um, kind of marginal image, which it's the devastating essay where he sort of ends up um, reflecting on the, the image of the animal in the zoo, kind of at the side of the cage, um, looking smaller um, than you, you kind of expected it to. And, you know, I, in, in this um, project, we wanted to think about um not just listening to animals but um also listening with animals um and listening as animals um and um kind of listening perhaps in a sort of more than human or other than human context um and um again this project was kind of structurally conceived as a question posed to a set of respondents um, whose works or responses were, were then kind of shared um, across a series of events um, and kind of used in, in, in a way to produce a sort of dossier or, or index of, of responses. So um, all of these um, projects are, are online with a great deal of um, documentation. So I'm going to kind of move through them um, fairly quickly, but just so you get a sense of, of, I guess, the way with liquid architecture that 
we're starting to think not so much in terms of um, singular events or, pro or projects, but um, in terms of investigations, um, long form um, research based um, ways of thinking about sound and listening, you know, as as methodologies um, for knowledge production in shared social space. You know, so some other examples of that include um, this project, Autotune Everything Art mm -hmm. and the Sonic Cosmic uh, Politic, which, you know, um, took autotune as, as, as a metaphor for a kind of, um, let's say, um, generalized normativity, the idea of sort of correcting um, aberrant pictures um, and tuning them in, in, in into something that was sort of in a normative sense, um, you know, correct or perfect. Um, this was a group of artists um, thinking sort of in experimental ways um, about what are the sort of sonic dimensions of that normative world um, and um, you know this project ritual community music it was you know liquid architectures um, concert series and experimental music program but it was very much um, you know r rather than just being about the presentation of you know different forms of experimental music and I'm sure you know you'll be familiar with many of the um, artists that we've presented in this um, context. It was really about thinking um, how music might operate as a model for civil society, decoding power structures, violence, um, empathy, ecstasy, cooperation. Um, what um, are the, the forms of community that are produced in the spaces of experimental music. And this really, um, for me, ha had its basis in m my experiences of, of, you know, improvisation and experimental music in, in London in, in the early 2000s, where um, what I felt I was experiencing was not just sort of a ra radical genre of music, but a kind of radical way of being in the world um, together kind of in opposition to certain um, kind of normative um, structures and forces. Okay, are you all still with me? Yes, we are. I don't know, I guess you can't read the chat, Joel. There's been a question from <laughs> Sarah, if you could say something a bit about Manus, if you're not already planning to do so. Yeah, I'll do that now. So what I'll, what I'll do now is um, I'll go into the eavesdropping project um, and I'll talk a little bit about eavesdropping and machine listening and um, and the Manus um, recording project now for, for, let's say, the next um, 20 to 30 minutes and, and then I'll open it up to conversation. Does that sound okay, Annie? That sounds wonderful. Okay. Um, all right. So, yeah, um, I'll talk about eavesdropping and machine listening. So, eavesdropping um, is a, you, you know, been a really important project um, for me. Um, it kind of it, it launched in 2018, um, but has its sort of roots um, further back. Um, this image, I'm going to sort of, this is something our designers. Uh, <laughs> uh, invented, which was a sort of blurred image that you um, have to rub up by sort of scrolling over the top of it. Um, so this is the performative part of my um, presentation is is simply me slowly and laboriously um, revealing this image. Um, here we go. So. Um, eavesdropping, um, well, as many things as a research project, as my PhD, um, as an exhibition, um, a series of working groups, a, a publication, a website, um, 
a, and a kind of framework um, for um, a, a whole lot of curatorial um, activities. Um, the project um, was fundamentally, uh, and I shouldn't talk about it in the in the past tense because I, I think it's sort of st still, um, you, you you know, has um, possibly some important stages to come. But um, the the project is um, a collaboration um, fundamentally with, with a colleague, a, a legal scholar, James Parker at um, Melbourne Law School. Um, who has um, been thinking, you know, about, about sound in super interesting ways for, for a number of years, you know, through the prism of, of a kind of cri critical legal perspective. So he's, he, he has um, written a lot about um, what he's called Law's Sonic Imagination, um, you, you know, which um, he, he, he thinks about in in relation to the kind of sonic worlds um, that we experience in legal spaces, like like in trials and in courtrooms, um, but also um, the way in which you know law tries to regulate and, and control sound, and 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 the way in which um, the laws of listening, you, you know, might articulate you know certain forms of power and and, and governance, and tell us things about the way that um, our, our societies, our, our sort of structures, you know, operate. Um, James has written a lot about the weaponization um, of sound w w within different um, kinds of spaces, bat the battlefield, the in interrogation room, uh, w w within civil societies, written on the sort of rather, you know, you know macabre and, and violent um, topic of, of, of sonic torture. Um, and you know, with James, um, I started to develop um, a, a kind of sense of um, thinking much more politically about sound and listening in relation to, you know, um, questions of surveillance, governance, power and control. Um, and th this word eavesdropping became very important um, to us, you know, because um it, it, it's a word that has a fascinating history um it, it it's a, actually um, a word that describes a crime or, or, or a public wrong um and there's a, a definition um which appears in um the, the the commentaries on the laws of england but by the the jurist william blackstone in, um published in in 1769 where he says eavesdroppers or such as listen under walls or windows or the eaves of a house to hearken after discourse and thereupon to frame slanderous and mischievous tales um, and they're a common nuisance and presentable at the court lead. Um, so, you know, this is a term eavesdropping that holds kind of law and listening together in, a, in an extremely productive way and what we wanted to think about, um, you know, w was, um, you know, w what is, what can the history of eavesdropping um, tell us about the practice today? How has the meaning of the term um, changed? You know, if the eavesdroppers um, of 1769, you know, in a British kind of village, context a, a sort of vagabonds who've trespassed you know into your home and who are or, you know or close to your home and are listening under walls or windows you know hearkening after discourse in order to sort of um you know slander you um with tales of what they've heard you know how is it that um in our context you know post edward snowden's revelations about um, you, you know, kind of the global surveillance um, networks that states um, ha ha have sort of surreptitiously imposed um, on, on the world and, and the kind of um, profoundly sonic dimensions of, of, of many of those um, 
systems um, you, you know for instance with um, the extraction of, of um, phone calls and you know the um, vocal biometrics and you know all of these kind of um, technologies but also techno-political complexes that um, link listening to power to control to governance to automation etc we're sort of thinking about um, how the story of the history of eavesdropping um, over these sort of many of many hundreds of years might il illuminate um, the past you know the present that that we sort of find ourselves in um, and also be a platform um, for I, I guess activist practices of um, resistance you know that 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 we um, called, um, you know, um, that, that that we named, let, let's say, ear, ear witnessing or, or sort of counter listening or or listening back. Um, so this was a project that um, took place across um, m multiple movements um, that that um, you know uh, worked. Um, across different sort of technologies, um, different um, politics. You can sort of see um, an extensive list um, of the events there and um, which are well documented. And I'll move on to the Manus project um, in just a second, which I think is a really important one. Perhaps just after, um, you know, introducing this image, um, you know, 16, 50. Um, so we're talking about an image that is, um, you know, um, what, 370 years old um, by the German Jesuit polymath Athanasius Kircher. It's called, um, it, it's from his book Musergia Universalis, which is a sort of um, massive multi part treatise on. Um, the physics of sound and, and sort of acoustics. And here he's mapping a system of sonic surveillance um, in, in which um, these sort of giant listening tubes, what he calls spy ears, um, are kind of uh, installed within the very architecture of, of the state. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of... Um, let's say a mechanism of listening um, that is embedded architecturally um, a, a, as a form of governance and you know we see um, the citizens of, of um, uh, you know in, in a kind of central plaza um, with this giant sort of um, openings um, which then concentrate to small apertures through um, piercing through the thick walls of, of a kind of palace um, into the interior where, where a kind of an aristocratic figure um, is, is able to kind of listen to a concentrated or distilled um, extraction of, of, of the noise um, that is captured from the public. So it's also, also sort of an image of sonic extraction um, and of listening as power. Um, and you know, it's a 370-year-old image of the kind of nascent surveillance state. Um, and so this image, along with the Blackstone definition of eavesdropping, became, you know, became two kind of, let's say, foundational historical um, references that it, it, in some ways we departed from with the contemporary works that we featured. Um, so someone has um, asked to hear about the Manus Recording Project. So I'm really happy to talk about that. I mean, I think it's um, I think it's important to talk about, um, especially you know, as an Australian person um, speaking to you today, and I, I'm kind of um, you know. How can I put this? Um, there's a, a deep sense of shame about um, 
you know, the political um, direction that Australia has gone in in, in in recent decades, a kind of reactionary, xenophobic, um, um, sort of more the conservative, extremely sort of right-wing um, direction um, in which the demonisation of refugees, the kind of um, post 9-11 um, Islamophobia, the sort of enthusiastic um, support for intervention and, in, and occupation in Iraq and Afghanistan, the sort of um, uncritical, um, you know, I, I suppose, um, media response to these things, the monopolisation of Australia's media um, by Rupert Murdoch is the highest sort of um, concentration of, of, of a media monopoly almost anywhere in the world. Some Australian states, um, every major newspaper is owned by Murdoch. Um, so, you know, um, and today we've just had a report that has come out um, detailing um, brutal and horrific war crimes by Australian soldiers um, in Afghanistan committed against civilians. Um, so, you know, the, the, this is the backdrop, I think, um, to this work in some ways, which is a work about um, the border, um, you know, separating Australia fr from the world um, and the way in which that border has sort of been militarised, weaponised, um, and, um, you know, po politically sort of leveraged um, in ways that have been sort of disastrous for, for um, you know, many, many people. Um, so what is this work? This is on Manus Recording Project Collective, Manus Island, um, is a remote island in, in Papua New Guinea. Um, it's a place where the Australian government um, has set up offshore detention um, camps. Um, it, it's a place where people seeking asylum um, in Australia have been sent um, and held um, for many, many years um, w without sort of hope of um, a resolution um, this text is a little bit out of date now, but we're talking about thousands of um, people um, held in makeshift prisons without legal representation or a sort of process um, to um, resolve the situation um, and sort of outside of Australia's legal jurisdiction. Um, so this, this project... Um, came from um, the work of Michael Green, Andre Dow, um, and John Tia. Um, Andre, a human rights lawyer, Michael, a journalist, and John, a podcast producer. Um, and they, um, M Michael um, was um, given the phone number of um, Abdul, uh, Abdul Aziz Mohammed um, Aziz, who was um, a Sudanese refugee um, who was being held on mass, um, who had a smuggled mobile phone, um, which he'd somehow um, got into the detention centre. And Michael and Aziz started, um, collab uh, started contacting each other using WhatsApp um, voice messages. Um, and th this was in around, I think, um, 2016, 17. Um, and um, over the course of a number of months, um, um, Michael and Aziz e exchanged thousands of uh, voice messages via WhatsApp. Um, the internet connections in, in Manus were very intermittent. So rather than sort of speaking in, in real time or exchanging messages in real time, they would sort of, uh, Aziz would record lots of messages and when he was able to get online, they would sort of all um, flood in um, to, to, to sort of Michael's inbox. Um, and those recordings formed the basis of 
a podcast called The Messenger, um, which is an absolutely remarkable um, podcast, which is sort of built from these WhatsApp voice messages um, and in which we sort of get, hear th through Aziz's smuggled mobile phone a kind of... Um, we hear a, a representation of, of life in offshore Australian detention um, that is a, son a sonic representation. It's sort of, you know, it's not just Aziz's voice, but voices of the um, other men, um, other prisoners, um, but, but even more so than that, the sort of carceral soundscape of, of, of the prison, um, which includes, you know, I guess sonic cues um, for for the environment. Um, this sort of um, tropical island, um, but one that is sort of marked um, by 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 this um, incredibly repressive structure. So um, th that that podcast, the messenger, was the basis. Um, on which um, James Parker and I approached um, the, the, the collaborators and, and asked them whether they would develop a new project for, um, for eavesdropping. Um, and the project that they developed um, was called How Are You Today? Um, and what it was, it was, it was um, a collaboration between, um, you know, Michael, Andre and John in, um, in Melbourne, um, and um, six men um, who were held on Manus um, at that time. Some are still um, in uh, Papua New Guinea. Some are in detention in Australia now, um, and a couple um, ha have won um, asylum in um, third countries. Beru's Buchani, um, some of you may know, wrote a remarkable memoir. <laughs> Um, on Manus Island, um, No Friend But The Mountain is the name of it, which, which he wrote um, one text message at a time um, to his translator in, in Sydney who compiled it as a book. Um, and it, it's considered to be um, a, a masterpiece, um, a literary masterpiece that includes sort of Kurdish long form poetry, pr prison memoir p and political analysis of um, the Australian carceral system, but this project, um, how are you today? Um, what we were able to do was um, bring six um, Zoom H1 audio recorders into the detention um, centre. They were they were kind of smuggled in um, in a sort of um, well, I won't go into detail, but um, we were able to get audio recorders um, to these guys. Um, in Manus Prison, um, along with phone credit um, that allowed um, them to make daily 10-minute um, recordings and then um, using the phone credit to upload them to Dropbox um, f from where um, they were streamed um, every day into the gallery where the eavesdropping exhibition was taking place. Um, so the experience um, at that time of the exhibition was that every day you go into the gallery and you would hear a 10 minute recording um, by Farhad or, or, or Samad or, or, or Shamandan um, from Manus Island um, that had been made sometimes just a few hours earlier, um, uploaded um, and then played back in the gallery. And by the exhibition's end, um, 84 recordings, 10 minutes each, um, produced a, a 14 hour archive, a, a kind of, um, a, 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 an incredibly detailed um, sonic archive of life on Manus Prison. Um, and in, as you can see here, um, everything can be listened to now. So dur over the, during the exhibition... Hi everyone, it's Samad from Port Mosby. It's uh, Saturday and it's my off day again. And I usually staying at home on my weekends. But 
Um, I, I, I'm not going to play you um, these here in the lecture, but I, I think um, that, I mean, there's a couple of reasons, but I, I think one is that it's, it's important to listen to recordings for the full 10 minutes, um, not just sort of um, exert them. But also I think um, if I were to play one or two recordings, it wouldn't be representative of um, the incredible sort of diversity and, and let's say even sort of incoherence of the 14 hour set. Um, you know, the, the, there are so many different kinds of um, recordings that were produced um, through this project, um, ranging from, you know, first person narration, um, which we just sort of heard a glimpse of from Samad, um, you, you know, who, who addresses the listener directly um, and, and kind of describes his situation through to kind of just, um, you know, almost ambient recordings of, um, you know, the, the, the carceral soundscape um, through to conversations, um, you know, in Arabic, Farsi, or, or um, in, in um, you know, other languages that we're, we're, we're sort of positioned as an outside listener uh, overhearing something that is sort of not necessarily made accessible to us um, through to many recordings of um, the men themselves um, listening, you know, some are um, at three in the morning listening to the creatures in the jungle. So in that sense, uh, many of the recordings sort of ask us to, you know, listen with the men rather than listen, you know, to them, let's say. Um, and I mean, there are so many things to say about this um, project um, and there's actually been quite a lot of writing um, done on on it already, which is um, being collected on, on the eavesdropping website. And I also know there's a forthcoming um, dossier in, in the journal Law Text um, Culture that looks specifically um, at the Manus recording project and, and sort of thinks about the, the, the meaning of these sounds um, and, and, you know, what it is to listen to them. Um, you know, but I think um, in some ways, um, what was most um, powerful about this, about listening to these recordings in real time and even subsequently was the sort of refusal to produce a sort of narrative, you know, often when you um, encounter, um, when you engage with sort of, you know, let's say refugee politics, um, or when um, someone in immigration mm -hmm. detention is given the opportunity um, to speak to a broad public, um, there there is sort of an intense pressure to t to tell the story, to re-narrate. Um, the sort of political complex or the or the biography or to sort of play um, for you know justice um, and in some ways this project took place at a moment of sort of the total exhaustion of that narrative that that had been produced and reproduced over and over and over endlessly um, with little political impact and um, what these recordings allowed for was a certain kind of you know, silence, stillness, absence of um, uh, narration, um, refusal to narrate, um, and a kind of listening, you know, with r rather than listening to, which um, had its own, um, let's say, um, political resonance. Um, the subsequent... Um, version of the Manus project, um, Where Are You Today, um, happened more recently. Um, let's see if I can... There we go. 
where are you today? Um, so this project just um, happened j just over um, recent months in, in July and August this year. Um, and rather than asking the question, how are you today, which was the kind of um, default, you know, qu question that we we're asking in 2018, um, as we were sort of concerned for the very sort of survival of these um, incarcerated refugees, um, the, the question becomes, where are you today? As the Manus prison was dismantled um, and the prisoners w were sort of dis um, dispersed um, to various um, different forms of incarceration um, in Australia and offshore, um, and so this project um, it, it included a, a, a number of men held in different kinds of immigration detention, including um, in um, hotels in Melbourne and, and Brisbane. It's quite ridiculous, but um, just about five kilometres away from where I'm, I'm speaking now in the, in the northern suburbs of Melbourne um, is a hotel, a rather kind of new agey sounding hotel called The Mantra, um, in, in, in which um, about 30 um, refugees who were held on Manus ha have been um, kept in the in this hotel for almost a year now um, on, on one floor, um, unable to leave the hotel in a kind of um, detention limbo. Um, so um, this this version of the project. Um, featured a recording every day for a month, um, kept the, the 10 minute um, format, um, but the project was um, uh, in the absence of an exhibition, um, you um, subscribed to it by um, texting a number um, and um, then every day um, Throughout August 20, you'd receive a text message with a link to the, the new 10 minute um, audio recording and it would tell you who made the recording and um, how long ago it was made and how far um, away the person who made it was from you. So it sort of located you as a listener um, geographically in, in relation to um, the recording. And, you know, so I'm it might be evasive sounding, but I'm, te I'm just tempted to sort of not say too much about the recordings themselves um, and just encourage you to spend time listening to them. I, I sort of think there's almost a violence to um, paraphrasing or describing them. Um, and so um, I, I prefer to let that listening experience um, be a kind of first-hand one, if that makes sense. Um, I'll come back um, to the main screen here because I guess it's 20 to 3 <laughs> in my part of the world. Um, and um, I wonder if um, there, you know, it might be time for some questions now. Um, you know, I, feel, I kind of feel like after talking about the Manus project, that in some ways it's a good moment to, um, you know, to open things, open things up, um, and, and possibly invite some some conversation. Um, you know, if there were if there was um, that there were two other things that I kind of wanted to mention, um, which were machine listening um, to you know very recent uh, mate you know, major project which has a great deal of continuity with um, eavesdropping and also um, to also mention that, you know, in the last few few months when we've been under lockdown um, with Melbourne as Melbourne has been under one of the most stringent lockdowns of any city um, in the world. We were under curfew, um, unable to leave our, our houses for um, many months at a time. Um, that I was going to say that liquid architecture, we've pivoted very strongly into into publishing, um, and that we've developed a publishing platform called called Disclaimer, where many of these sort of projects um, live in the absence of a kind of sh shared physical spaces. 
Um, but um, thanks, Annie, for for sharing the machine listening um, project. I think um, in a way it's probably too complex to open it up now. Um, so thanks, everyone. I have no idea whether that was um, crazy, sort of boring, interesting, or a combination of those things. Um, but yeah, it's 2.45 a.m. for me. So, you know, my radar is <laughs> wayward. But yeah, thanks for your support and encouragement. Thank you so much, Joel. Um, no, it was a fantastic lecture. I mean, I don't know how you managed to make so much sense despite it being a ridiculous time in the morning for you. So yeah, massive, massive thanks. And I think it was just so multifaceted the way that you presented the different stages of your career and your work. And I, I just really appreciate the kind of ongoing project of like the politics and the ethics of sound art and experimental music, but through the the different things that you've done over the years, kind of see, doing this from different angles has been um, really fascinating to hear you um, kind of put that together in a presentation. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, Right, so I would like to suggest a really short break just for everyone to um, get away from the computer for two minutes and take a sip of water um, before we start with the student-led Q&A. So um, in UK time, it's 3.46. Let's meet back at 3.48, so don't go away too far. Um, we'll start back in two minutes. So please take a little break, Joel, um, after speaking for so long. See you all in two minutes. Thank you. Right, so I make it 3.48 UK time. Glad to see you've not fallen asleep, Joel. <laughs> that was a quick refresh. Um, right, so how this works is we will have our um, student group. If you could just put your hands up and I will make you presenters. Everyone who was in this week's um, uh, Q&A group. Um, I don't know how you decided to do it this week, but um, we'll let you start. Uh, and then if the rest of the audience could give the students at least kind of three or four questions before um, you're very welcome um, after they've kind of had their chance to ask their questions to put your hands up and um, ask your questions too. Is anyone else in the group? I've only, I can only see you, Matthew. Um, you don't all have to speak um, as we've done in previous weeks. So I think I've got a few other names on the list, here we go, great. Lovely. Okay. 
Brilliant. Anyone else? All right. Okay, well, please take it away, whoever, whoever's starting. Hi there, I'll jump in. Hi Joel, um, I'd just like to extend uh, gratitude on behalf of all of the community here for your time and like for the fact that it's so late. So thank you so much. <laughs> um, I, I thought that the, the, the vibe about ethics was really interesting. So I've got, um, one of my questions is really actually quite basic. Um, and I've got a couple which are a bit more provocative. Um, on, on ethics. Um, so one, basically, just for the, for the benefit of everybody, from the, from the perspective of um, a room full of sound artists, what would you advise um, or everybody in the room to do to raise their profile with curators? And then also, uh, conversely, what would you advise an emerging curator to do to um, basically get, their, uh, get themselves on the art world radar? <laughs> so sorry those are the um provocative and the basic questions or oh, no, that, so that, 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 yeah that's just yeah general guidance um okay should i answer that should i answer that now and then sorry and then you'll have further questions or yeah if that's all right yeah i'll, 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 yeah. I'll just I'll, one more i don't want to dominate the q &A. um <clears throat> sure yeah yeah um what would i advise I mean, I mean that. I mean it's very tricky. Um, I, I I think. Um, what do I look for in work? Um, is uh, uh, I'm I'm looking for something that is, you know, idiosyncratic. That is grounded in research. That um, has a kind of dis discipline about it that um, has a kind of long form, um, you know, that has some sort of intellectual labor that can be sort of um, evidenced. Uh, I, I mean, um, uh, uh, it's, re it's really hard to say, it's really hard to say because, I th you know, I think um, the art world, you know, if it is a world, let's put world in sort of, you know, uh, scare quotes um, just for a moment. Um, it, it's a world that doesn't really make a lot of sense. I mean, um, and it, you know, it's a world in which um, it, you know notions of, of, of sort of value um, and success are kind of produced and reproduced in in sort of you know very mysterious ways and sometimes quite cyn cynical ways. You know, and, and sometimes success is a sort of a function of you know, pow power and privilege in in certain ways. So, you know, perhaps um, I, c I can't say um, what I would advise artists or curators to do to be sort of more successful, but I, I can say that um, I'm interested, um, you know, I I in the way in which um, acts of listening, you know, can produce um, new kinds of social relationships between people um, that can sort of produce um, transformative sort of experiences that resonate sort of politically and socially as as well as aesthetically. Um, and I'm also looking. I'm I'm also interested in ways that um, you know artists might use practices of sound and listening to, um, let's say, intervene in conversations that have sort of um, felt sort of exhausted or fatigued or sort of have reached a sort of end point in in other kind of modes so in the case of the Manus work you know we've we've talked about refugee politics endlessly we've made every possible argument we've narrated and re-narrated the issue um, but this 14 hour audio archive sort of does something different you know um, it sort of presses against that issue in a, in a completely different way. Um, so perhaps my advice is to sort of um, think about, yeah, ha, ha, how, how you might sort of crack open or sort of um, il illuminate or, or, or sort of in the con to bring it back to a sonic kind of, um, y you know, uh, metaphor or ground. To, to sort of make audible what was previously inaudible 
let's say, in any given context. Um, so, you know, okay, so that's not a sort of recipe for art world success, but just to say that, that that's where I would kind of prick up my ears and take a strong interest in in um, the work. Okay, awesome. Thanks for that. Um, cool. Um, so the provocative questions, are, uh, they're about um, <laughs> surveillance and also recording from inside prison. So uh, there's mm. work that I'm, um, that I'm considering, and I'm really interested in your, your ethical view on this. It's called The Last Bastion, and it's about essentially uh, performing um, surveillance as, as an artistic practice in public spaces. So we consider like a conversation between two people in public in an open space um, to be private. And I'm interested in actually miking up those spaces and recording people's conversations. Mm. What's your take on the ethics? Because there's zero consent, of course, for anybody that's involved in that. Hmm. Um, well, on the surface, it, um, lack of consent would suggest um, ethical <laughs> challenges um, and, and, and problems in a work like that. So um, it's sort of hard, hard, hard for me to say. I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the things that, helped me to understand the eavesdropping project was um you know th at thinking with um the french theorist P peter gendy um who whose um recent book all, all is the aesthetics of espionage um sort of talk, talks about overhearing um sort of in very playful ways and he sort of, sort of talks about listening as as fundamentally excessive in the sense that um, we, we often hear too much, you know, or, or more than we mean to. Um, and, and so therefore, you, you know, um, eavesdropping is, um, the question is not whether, you know, to eavesdrop or not, it, it's sort of the ethics of doing so. Um, and so sounds often sort of come to us unintended. Um, and I also think about Brandon LaBelle's um, kind of work in, in, in um, the context of sonic agency where he talks about you know overhearing as a sort of an encounter with the, with the stranger or as a sort of a form of interruption um you know where you know you it's sort of like he hearing the other um and sound is this sort of thing that permeates let's say the space between ourselves um and others in in unexpected ways you know um, so he sort of recuperates the interruption as sort of a really positive um, sonic figure as as um, the thing which sort of, let's say, de disturbs our sense of self as a sort of separate from others. Um, you know, the questions I, I would have um, for you is sort of what, what would take a practice like that um, beyond just sort of being a, a, a voyeuristic um kind of practice and you know what is the critique that that you're doing you know if you're sort of like simply reproducing um tropes of surveillance culture um w we all know that we live in a world um in which you know e e everything we do is, is sort of surveillable can be extracted sort of monetized um, you, you know, um, commoditized and, and potentially, you know, used again against us in in certain ways. And um, I would suggest that um, myself, you know, as a white Australian middle class man, you know, I, I'm not a person that is um, as vulnerable to practices of surveillance as as many, many, many other people. Um, are so I would be careful not to trivialize surveillance culture um, in ways that sort of expose the fact that I don't feel threatened by it um, when you know um, there are so many people around the world who are legitimately um, fe fearful <laughs> you, you know of, of, of those forms of surveillance so yeah um, that, that would be, and the machine listening project, um, which I, I didn't get to speak about, I mean, I think I'd encourage you to sort of have a look at that because I think that goes further into 
what it means to move from a paradigm in which, you know, people are listening to each other in order to sort of um, extract information um, into one in which there are sort of automated algorithmic forms of listening that sort of um, capture and harvest sonic data in, in much more absolute ways that become, you know, predictive and, and structural, um, you know, and also we have, you know, we're carrying around surveillance listening devices in our pockets, aren't we? And all of our smart speakers and all of our stuff. So in some ways you micing up public space is a little redundant when um, everyone is already carrying around <laughs> listening devices in their pockets, um, you know. So anyway, I, I hope that's sort of not, not too critical um i'm not discouraging you um, that those would just be the questions that would come up for me <laughs> yeah i think i think for me like when, when i think about that that trivializing of surveillance culture is a way of mocking it and also mm -hmm. like the last bastion is that, with, that when you're not being listened to uh, the idea that you don't realize you're being listened to i, I feel that that's um that's mm -hmm. your eavesdropping project takes care of that in a really sensitive way um, and mm. also on the subject of sensitivity, I'd be really interested in your view on something. So um, I've got contact with uh, somebody in a prison who's uh, on a on a phone, um, and they, mm. they send me messages, and I also have access to their private messages. And I've been considering how to sensitively approach this person committed a very brutal, cold-blooded murder, um, and it's somebody like that I've known for a, a long time. And I've been really interested in how I can use my access to this person and um, and their messages from 15 years ago uh, to date and how I could sensitively approach that and create some kind of artwork from it. Because I'm aware that it, it's it's like it's hype controversy and it's quite, quite um, like showboating of a murderer kind of thing. So um, what would what would your thoughts on that be and also about the equality do does somebody that has committed a cold-blooded murder also deserve a voice um yeah i mean i'm not sure i feel sort of qualified in some ways to <laughs> answer um well or let me put it another way i'm just not sure um there's a sort of um yes or no answer to a to a a question like that but I mean I think um, it really depends on um, the nuances of the work itself um, and you, you know I suppose um, of course um, a, pr a prisoner um, whose voice has been recorded um, of, of course lis listening to that voice um, is not inherently um, an, an ethical problem, um, but I just think you need to ask yourself um, whether you are kind of exploiting a kind of voyeuristic tendency um, that people might have to sort of, let's say, re revel in some sp spectacle uh, um, of, of, of um, you know, criminality or, or the prison system um, and whether that can actually sustain a meaningful artwork. Um, and I think in order for an artwork like that to be meaningful, you know, it, it would have to, um, those recordings and that audio would have to reveal um, something in, in, inherent to the audio that, you know, couldn't be um, communicated just sort of simply through a narrative account. Um, so that's why when I talk about the Manus work, I talk about the carceral soundscape. Um, and one of the things about that soundscape is, okay, someone might be talking into the Zoom recorder and narrating an experience, um, but that's not all we're hearing. We're hearing the background noise. We're hearing the environment in which they speak. Um, we're hearing, we're eavesdropping, we're always hearing more than was meant to be heard. Um, and it's, it's in that sort of um, excess of, of listening and excess of sound that it becomes more than just a sort of macabre spectacle. And I, I think of it almost like 
becoming an auto ethnography or or a kind of um, an, an oral archive. Um, so that 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 would be that would be my interest. Um, I, I, from the way you're putting it, it's, it sounds to me like you're sort of very, very excited about the spectacular dimension um, of this work, but I would sort of suggest that you'll need to go beyond that if you want to sort of sustain a, a, a really productive and meaningful project. I, th I thought it was interesting, like the, the idea of something being meaningful. So. Is it possible to bit for well, what are the kind of objective attributes of, of an artwork being meaningful? Because I mean, like the, the, the mad work is definitely meaningful, and like the Lawrence Abu Hamdan Turner Prize um, from last year, totally meaningful. And I, f I find it interesting, like when w when does an artwork become meaningless, and does that become a property of the artwork in itself, which is self aware of? Um, I mean, I think. An artwork becomes meaningful in its encounter with an audience in a sort of given political, social, and cultural context. Um, the Manus work <clears throat> was meaningful in an Australian context because um, it was, a, a, you know, a fairly profound intervention in the way that um, the voices of refugees were heard, but also. Um, it was a circumvention of um, the kind of distance that the Australian government had intentionally placed between the offshore detention regime and the Australian public. So journalists couldn't get to Manus Island. There were very few images. There were very few recordings. It was intentionally somewhere as far away and inaccessible as possible. Um, and these audio recordings. Um, were a form of ear witnessing. They were a production of a form of sort of acoustic evidence um, that um, help in, in a way evidence um, a, a brutal crime per perpetrated against these men. Um, so that's why we sort of think about it in terms of acoustic justice, ear witnessing, listening back, um, counter surveillance um, even. Um, and so um, how does an artwork become meaningful? I mean, I sort of won't <laughs> attempt um, an, an answer there, but I, I think um, something about cultural production, which is grounded in um, movements for justice, movements for inclusion, um, movements that disrupt, you, you know, um, entrenched, hierarchies of exclusion and movements that expose different forms of violence or oppression. I mean, I think it's easy to make an argument that artworks that do that are meaningful. And I don't want to say that art, only artworks that are explicitly political do that. I also think formal and aesthetic experimentation um, is absolutely important. Um, so, yeah, but maybe maybe I'll, maybe I'll leave it at that because I think, you know, th th this answer could otherwise become <laughs> too too philosophical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, I feel that. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, you mentioned uh, Danny Savella and Peter Gendi. Would you mind spelling those names for us? Um, I've Danny Savella. In the the chat. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know what the other yeah. one was. Um, um Peter. Yeah, Peter Gendi, um, and he's shared, um, yeah. I, I think, a very interesting French literary theorist um, and who's had a, you know, very long um, engagement with questions of listening. Danny Zavella, um, an Australian um, curator and researcher who's done a lot of work on, um, you know, feminist practices of listening and is also now doing a lot of work around um, indigenous language um, preservation, conservation, and and production in an Australian context. And you know, so, so that's something I didn't mention in the talk that much. But we do a lot of like there's a, there's a you know really important part of liquid architectures um, curatorial practice and publishing practice, which is um, working with 
um, Indigenous and First Nations artists um, to de um, develop and share d different kinds of sonic practices to do with, you know, language, you know, sovereignty um, and, and other issues. And, and so Danny is very committed to that. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. Great thank question, you. Matthew, um, and really good answers too, Joel. So um, thanks both for that. Does anyone else from the student group want to jump in with some of the questions that you've been preparing? Don't know how you organised it. I've seen that there are some more questions. Uh, yeah, we've got a bunch of questions. Does anybody else want to dive in? No, I'm happy to. to uh... Okay, we've got one from Kiro. Um, was Kiro, Kiro, are you in the group? Um, I'm just going to enable people's audio and video. Kiro, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I, I was in the group. Oh, you were in the group? Yeah, I um, have, I, um, I wasn't here for the first five minutes of it. I don't know if any questions have been uh, read out yet. No, not yet. I don't think. I think Matthew's okay. asked a few of um, your own questions. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. So I can start with uh, a question from Kai. Um, so in some small way, we, oppose, we can oppose surveillance on our own devices by covering the webcam or um, throwing off facial recognition. What can we do to counteract malicious machine listening? Hmm. Well, um, there are many, many strategies um, <clears throat> for that. And I think, um, you know, they range from um, individual acts of resistance, like you mentioned, which are to do with sort of media hacking and device um, hacking and, um, let's say, you know, f f forms of um, obfuscation that make you kind of... Um, inaudible to machine listeners um, and in the program we did for Unsound there's a session um, lessons in how not to be heard um, and that session kind of um, riffs on a film by Hita Stale um, how not to be seen um, in which she kind of um, you know rather playfully details a series of strategies that would sort of make you invisible um, to the machine vision, like things like be smaller than a pixel, um, et, et cetera, et cetera, blend into the background. Um, so, you know, um, the lessons in how not to be heard, um, I mean, I think there's a sort of, um, limitation in acts of sort of symbolic individual um, resistance to um, what is essentially a kind of um, transnational technical apparatus that doesn't, you know, really care if people turn off their cameras um, or whatever um, from time to time. Um, you know, the reality is that... Um, you know, surveillance capitalism, as as Shoshana Zuboff, you know, has called it recently, a platform capitalism, as Nick, Nick Cernicek has called it. It, it, it's creating a new world in which uh, if you don't make yourself surveillable, it's very hard to participate. Like even here on this platform, you know, today, um, like how would we participate in this pedagogical environment um, without ex sort of exposing ourselves um, to a kind of completely pervasive and, and totalizing system um, of surveillance. So I think the answer is in, in individual resistance. I think it's in developing um, a more critical techno politics um that um is in a way um takes back some form of agency and control um from 
the um, corporate and state entities um, that are instituting um, a kind of machine listening apparatus on a global scale. So let's say, you know, it's not, I mean, since the pandemic, Jeff Bezos has added, what, $100 billion to his um, <laughs> bank account. Um, Amazon Alexa, um, you know, ha has, um, I think, a staff of sort of 30 or 40,000 people ju just working on speech recognition, speech activation in a touchless um, economy um, in, in a moment where, you know, touching is toxic, is a vector of infection, in which breath of other humans is a vector of infection. You, you can sort of see the appeal of um, voice activation and smart speakers that sort of don't breathe. Um, you know, but I think the, the point is um, that, um, you know, a group of small companies, especially based in Silicon Valley, um, are extracting you know, from our sonic worlds, um, the, the, the biggest database on human behaviour that ha has ever existed um, and, you know, are using it in ways that are very far from transparent and sort of in which there's no democratic oversight at all. Um, and so um, I think the site of the battle you know, the side of contestation is around the politics of data, extractivism, um, and surveillance capitalism, ra ra rather as a system, rather than just sort of um, as individuals, you know, t um, taping over the camera or, or turning your GPS off or, or that kind of thing. Not, not that I'm discouraging you from doing those things, but I just think um, politically, we need a structural response rather than a sort of individual li libertarian <laughs> kind of response. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the answer. Yeah. Um, Alex has just put a question. I can read that one out. Um, or if someone else would like me to read their question, I, I can do that. Um, so, on avoiding surveillance, what happens when we adapt the way we communicate with others as to not be heard by the de devices which surround us? And if we go out of our way um, uh, to bend our own or, uh, personal oralities, do you think uh, do you think this affects how meaningful our engagements in the world can be? And um, have we gained back our agency, or is it entirely lost? Um, I really like the idea of um, kind of coded forms of communication that are indecipherable to machine listeners. And, you know, there was one of the works in machine listening was um, to um, Indigenous Australian artists speaking um, in Wiradjuri, which is a um, Aboriginal language sort of in the New South Wales, Sydney area. Um, and at the same time, um, Google transcription sort of applications which were trying to transcribe the conversation and, you know, it was completely indecipherable, um, you know, to, to, the, um, to the speech to text application. So, you know, one of the strategies for how not to be heard is to speak a language that is in, indecipherable to the machine. Um, and in some ways I'm kind of, you know, thinking about, um, the history of different sort of forms of, let's say, um, verbal abstraction, like like concrete poetry um, and other kind of, you know, li linguistic conceptual experiments as, you know, potentially you could sort of think of that as a prehistory of kind of co coded communication of, of a sort of um, a, a res a, an aesthetic, of indecipherability, which is um, in some ways fugitive, evasive, um, re resistant to to capture, but which is sort of meaningful to those who um, engage engage with it. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think, um, you know, sound itself, um, if we can say such a thing, <laughs> you know, um, I, I think probably even the formulation sound itself is, you know, quite problematic because it gets sort of very essentialist or sort of ontological or something like that. But I think for me, sound is almost always, if not always, signification. It's it's always semiotic. It's always a text to be read as well as, you know, a sound to be heard. Um, and the um, way in which our sonic worlds are sort of harvested and um, and um, aggregated um, and analysed um, is not limited to what we say. So it's also, you know, like a, like emotion detection in, in the voice, like ge gender detection in the voice, like accent recognition um, algorithms, um, aggression detection, et cetera, et cetera, um, lie detection you know, specifically is not um, located in what we say, but how we say it. Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's it's very complex. Um, and the question of, yeah, our voices and how they operate in the world and who they belong to and with what agency and um, is, yeah, it's a, it's a complex one. I can see there's some more, some more questions, so maybe I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, and so, like adding on from from what you just said, uh, what do you think the psychological consequences of of constantly being heard and uh, uh, publicly heard and to the person who is talking? Um, different for everyone. I mean, um, you know, um, there's a um, theorist Bert Bernard Harcourt who who, who wrote a book a couple of years ago called Exposed, where he talks about um, the fact that we, we live in an expository society um, where, where there is a sort of a compulsion to expose oneself, um, you know, co constantly um, in the form of, you, you know, um, that we want to be seen and we want to be heard um, and that that's almost, you know, being produced sort of um, as a pathological symptom of, of a certain, you know, form of capitalism and and sort of let's say, so, you know, social um, mediation, um, and so, you know, um, that manifests as a desire to be heard. Um, so what is the impact of like being constantly overheard? I mean, it completely depends on who you are and in what context um, that overhearing takes place. I mean, um, Lawrence Abu Hamdan's work was brought up earlier and, you know, I think he's such an important artist and such an incredible artist and I sort of feel very privileged to, you know, to have worked with Lawrence a lot over, over recent years, he, his work. Uh, he had three three works of his were in eavesdropping and he's um you know d d done a number of projects with liquid architecture and um y you know um he, in his works um there is you know he maps out the kind of um the the way in which um, sound listening and being heard um, is um, a sort of a, a form of violence, it, it, you know, it, um, in which, um, you know, the ability to listen pervasively is a, is a, is a sort of form of power that um, is enacted sort of brutally. So I think... Um, in Lawrence's work, if you're a prisoner, you know, in in a in a Syrian prison, for instance, in in the Sidonia work, um, the impact of being overheard um, is that um, those prisoners learned to live in almost absolute silence for for months and years in ways that, you know, 
um, if they survived, sort of cha changed them for, for life, including people who came out and who were subsequently unable to speak, you know, because they had been silent for so, for so long. Um, if you're someone with a po sort of political platform um, and, you know, um, who sort of speaks for a living, then you may become addicted to um, the audience that hears you and sort of d d desire to constantly be sort of heard. So, I, yeah, I think it's there's a dynamics that um, can't be, is irreducible um, like like much of what we, we're discussing. Yeah. Keith, uh, we've got a question. Um, yeah, from the chat. Yeah. Yeah, should, should I read it out? Yeah, or we could ask Iman, would you like to come on the microphone if you're there? You can just turn it on, I think. Or if not, then Kira could we read out. Okay, I was just wondering if the word liquid architecture, um, have you ever tried actually um, the, uh, studying the impact and listening to the um, different spaces forms as architecture itself and how it impacts or the kind of listening when you listen to the social people inside this type of space i mean use architecture as a real architecture or is it with you just used as a metaphor um depends how you define architecture i mean um like the well, last time I was in London, I was um, working with um, the Goldsmiths um, Centre for Research Architecture, and you know, and with the group Forensic Architecture, and um, they're not making buildings, you know, but they are um, bringing an architectural skill set, you know, different forms of ma mapping, spatial design, um, di sort of diagramming. Um, you, you know, th thinking about the sort of behaviour of sounds and images within the built environment um, and using those as sort of analytic and diagnostic um, tools. Um, and so I, I would think about architecture in expanded terms um, also. Um, when we um, say liquid architecture, Yes, of course, we're not specifically talking about the kind of architectural practices um, that that most people would imagine. Um, but of course, I'm very, um, you know, interested in the way in which um, sound and list practices of sound and listening are, are spatially inscribed, you know, um, what it means to listen in a gallery as opposed to a courtroom, as opposed to a classroom, as opposed to on the internet. And so we can think of each of those things as architectures. Um, they have acoustic properties to do with the building materials and the walls and, the, you know, and all of that. But they're also architectures of, you know, control and normativity and sort of behaviour um, as well. So, um yeah, the, uh, I recently did a project um, with, with um, two writers um, where we were reflecting on an on a old industrial um, silo, like a huge hollow tower that um, was um, the last remaining remnants of a, of a decommissioned um, a factory, a knitting mill. And um, in that project, that project was called Songs You Can't Hear, um, and um, it's published on um, Liquid Architecture's General Disclaimer. And in, in that project, we thought about um, that silo as both a literal echo chamber, you know, inside a silo, sounds kind of reverberate and, and are sort of captured and kind of en endlessly reproduce, but also thought about it um, as a sort of metaphoric echo chamber, as a place where, say, history... Um, you know, m might sort of echo and be reproduced in the present and and where we might sort of um, think about the sonic worlds of, of the past as somehow still resonant within 
um, an architectural space. So I hope that's not too much of an abstract answer, but um, just to say, yes, I, th I think about architecture a lot, but um, perhaps in more expanded terms. Okay, thank you for your questions. Um, I think as time is running out, we will wrap up unless anyone has a kind of real burning urge to throw one last question at Joel. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much for all those questions and Joel for those really thoughtful answers. I really appreciate them and the many references. I was trying to post links and type out names for the ones that I recognize for people to um, yeah, note those down and bring them into your research and your work and your studies uh, moving forward. Um, so much to think about, really incredibly rich stuff and complex, messy, ethical things, as I think Matthew's very <laughs> challenging questions brought to the fore. Mm -hmm. So keeping you on your toes at 3.30 a.m. <laughs> Relentless. Um, but really brilliant, really appreciate you coming, Joel, and um, sharing your work with us. It's been really inspiring and, yeah, fantastic that you are an alumnus and um, out there doing really brilliant things. Um, yeah, really brilliant. Thank you so much, Joel. Um, um, yeah, my pleasure. Um, it was um, not as hard as I thought to stay up all night talk talking to you guys. So, um, you know, um, it was it was lots of fun and just yeah, um, I think it's a really excellent program that you're you're also running and I keep um, up to date with it and and I'm always checking out what what you guys are doing um, at LCC. So you know, keep up the good work too and just encourage um, anyone who's listening um, who wants to be in touch with me. You, you're very welcome to to write and to if um, you have sort of ideas or, or things that you want to kind of share or, or talk about. Um, that's that's what I do. That's what I'm committed to, ha having these conversations. Um, and so, you know, feel invited to reach out. That's lovely. Thank you. Very generous of you. Fantastic. Okay, well, we will let you go off into your early morning and hopefully get some sleep. Massive, massive thanks, Joel, and thank you to our students um, for leading the Q&A and for, to our guests for coming too. Um, fantastic. Thanks so much, Joel. Bye. Uh, okay, just a quick note to everyone now.